Dr. Summer, do you have an option of sitting somewhere that's not backlit by a bright window? Because we really can't see you. But if you have no other options, it's fine. Nope, I do. Here's what we'll do. Uh, much better. There you go. Perfect. I'm a little crooked, but we'll figure it out. Good. Oh, that's much better. Now, the plane was uh, leaving earlier than anticipated, so I just came on out to the airport. No problem. So thank you, everyone, for your patience. We're just waiting for our uh, uh, panelist, Dr. Groff, to uh, connect. And I... So, uh, Dr. Groft, are you are you with us at least with the audio? If need be, I can go first. Okay, uh, Dr. Groft. So, if you can uh, just wait a second, and then um, hopefully the icon for the camera, that green icon to the right of your name, will pop up, and then if you can just click on that, then uh, I think we'll all be ready to go. Okay. Am I coming through yet? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, great. I don't know if the picture is up or not, but uh, I'll check. Go ahead. Please start. My okay. apologies. Very good. Well, thank you uh, to everyone for your patience. Welcome, everyone, to the first in a two-part series of webinars called Understanding Rare Disease Registries. My name is Shira Kramer. I'm an epidemiologist and president of Global Epi Research, which is an epidemiological research and consulting firm located in Maryland. This webinar series is aimed at providing practical guidance and recommendations to patient groups who are interested in developing patient registries or natural history studies <coughs> in this area. In this first webinar, which is scheduled to last approximately 90 minutes, will provide an overview of general considerations and issues that should be considered in planning a robust registry. And the second webinar, to be held on October 23rd, will go into more detail about certain key topics and components involved in building a registry. At the end of today's webinar, we'll invite you to submit questions and topics that you'd like to learn about in greater detail in the second webinar. During today's webinar, if you have any questions you'd like to ask of the speakers, you can go to the right-hand panel, click on the Q&A box, and type in your question. And now, in the drop-down menu, be sure to select and send the question to me, Shira Kramer. I'll be compiling the questions you submit throughout the session, and after all the speakers have completed the presentation. We'll have a Q&A session with whatever time remains. Throughout the webinar, you'll also see that a variety of polling questions will appear in the right-hand panel. Please take a moment to answer these questions when you see them appear. At the end of the polling period, which will last about five minutes, we'll display the results of the poll for everyone to see. Finally, if you have any technical difficulties during the webinar, you can contact Katie at the email address or phone number listed on this slide. So with that, I'll go ahead and start today's webinar. As I mentioned previously, my name is Shira Kramer. I'm an epidemiologist and president of Global Epi Research, which is an epidemiological research and consulting firm located in Maryland. I'll be providing you with an overview of some essential steps and considerations for planning and building a robust patient registry. And by robust, I mean a registry which can answer the research questions and meet the goals and objectives of those stakeholders in setting and funding the registry. We'll then hear from two distinguished scientists, rare disease advocates, Dr. Stephen Groff, the director of the Office of Rare Diseases Research at the National Institutes of Health, and Dr. Marshall Summer, Division Chief at the Center for Genetic Medicine Research at the Children's National Medical Center, who will speak about resources and tools that are available to patient advocacy groups to design histories and natural history studies. And finally, we'll hear from Megan O'Boyle from the Phelan McDermott Syndrome Foundation, 
who will describe the challenges, successes, and lessons learned in designing and implementing a patient registry. A patient registry is a collection of data on patients with a specific condition or related condition. However, a patient registry is really defined by its purpose, that is, the benefits or goals that the registry is expected to provide to patients, researchers, and other stakeholders. Very important, clearly stated purpose or set of goals determines the design, implementation, and cost of the registry. The reasons for creating patient registries may include creating a listing of patients for the purpose of patient networking and clinical trial recruitment, and a way to document document patient reported outcomes and lifestyle issues of concern. A major impetus for creating a registry is often to spur drug development, which requires documentation of the natural history of the disease and key clinical or functional endpoints that could be a target of new therapies. A registry may also serve as a resource for ongoing research questions focused on patient subgroups, such as questions about fertility, psychosocial issues, and employment and financial impact. Because the purpose of the registry determines how it will be designed and administered, a critical first step will be to define the registry goals and set up an infrastructure with the appropriate team that can achieve these goals. A well-designed registry can serve as a critical resource for improving the lives of patients and the development of new therapies. However, you cannot assume that just by virtue of setting up a registry, you'll be able to accomplish all of these goals. Decisions made in designing the registry and the data collection tools will directly affect the ability of the registry to function as anticipated. We'll address practical aspects of this process in this webinar series. So as we just discussed, one of the major benefits of a patient registry is that it can be used to collect information on the natural history of disease. A natural history study is the collection of data over time to determine the typical progression of the disease in the absence of treatment. This information is very important in order to identify endpoints for the development and evaluation of therapies, and of course this information is required in order to obtain FDA approval for drugs. The term natural history study is sometimes used interchangeably with the term patient registry. There are some subtle differences between the two, but the concepts and goals are often very similar. Over most of the rest of this webinar, we'll use the term patient registry, but the concepts being discussed apply to natural history studies as well. Typically, patient registries utilize patient-reported data, since patients live with their disease every day. And they can provide very accurate and important information about their personal experiences, patient-reported outcomes, quality of life, and other factors. Additionally, Patient registries may contain clinician-entered data or data from medical records or laboratory tests. This is the optimal situation since it allows for validation of diagnosis and certain clinical parameters that are well captured in a medical record. However, this is not always feasible due to the cost or other logistical factors. Most registries are voluntary and require patients to opt in to participate. As a result, patients in registries are unlikely to be representative of all patients with the condition because participation requires knowledge of the diagnosis, awareness of the registry, and willingness to participate. Therefore, registries may only capture the most severely affected patients, or the patients who have access to specialized medical care resulting in a diagnosis. Because the registry represents a highly selected group of patients, it's also important to point out that any interpretation of data gained from the registry is really only applicable to the enrolled patients, and may not represent represent the experiences of all patients. Therefore, while the data gathered can still be very important and meaningful, they just must be viewed and interpreted with this fact in mind. Finally, it's important to point out that except in rare conditions, voluntary patient registries are not optimal for estimating the incidence or prevalence of a condition. So what I'd like to do now is quickly outline some steps that I believe to be critical for planning and and ultimately designing and maintaining a successful patient registry or natural history study. And these steps are outlined for you here on this slide, and on the following slides, I'll discuss each of these steps in greater detail. One of the first steps that should be undertaken is identifying the key registry stakeholders and creating a registry advisory committee. This committee should include representatives from the various registry stakeholders <laughs> and include experts on the condition. 
typically clinicians or other types of key opinion leaders. Patients and patient advocates should certainly be included on the advisory committee, and it is recommended that an epidemiologist or other professional with expertise in registry design and survey research techniques also be included <coughs> to help ensure that the decisions on registry design are methodologically sound and that the data collection tools are capable of answering the research questions of interest to the registry stakeholders. But ultimately, there should be a single person or entity responsible for managing this advisory committee and for making and implementing final decisions. Once the advisory committee is in place, it should work to define the goals for the registry, both short and long term. These goals should first be defined independent of budgetary considerations and can later be refined once certain other budgetary and design decisions have been made. The committee should also make sure that the registry goals map to the issues that are of greatest relevance to the patient community, to researchers, drug developers, regulatory bodies. <laughs> the goals will at least in part dictate decisions about the registry design, registry platform, and data collection tools. To the degree possible, registries should be designed for future value with the long-term goals in mind, even if the initial phase of registry implementation and data collection is more limited. This kind of forward planning preserves value and efficiency, and it's important in identifying the initial data that should be captured, but it can also ensure that the registry will be able to address short-term questions without having to later redesign the registry or the data collection tools. Many years to, complete, to collect complete data on the national natural history of a condition, but you, you have to start somewhere. It may not be a short-term goal of the registry to collect data on the natural history of the condition, but if you're able to collect information when patients first register about both their current disease state as well as their past disease experience, then you're well on your way to being able to capture natural history. At a later date, if you're able to follow up with registry participants over time, you can collect new information about their disease since they last reported to the registry. So by doing this, then, you will be well on your way to having a natural history study just by collecting data efficiently at the outset. During the planning stage, decisions will need to be made about who will be included and excluded from participation in the registry. Decisions will affect the budget, the representativeness of the registry data, and the potential utility of the data of biopharma companies. A common issue in many rare disorders is that patients may be quite heterogeneous in terms of their genotypes, phenotypes, and the causal factors related to their disorder. Etiology, survival, and diagnostic accuracy may also vary by geography or by socioeconomic status. Therefore, it's important to determine the population of patients who want to identify and register and acknowledge that reaching, reaching certain patient subgroups may be difficult and therefore will be will be un underrepresented in the registry unless certain specific steps are taken. Next, it's important to establish a case definition and decide upon the data that will be necessary to establish a confirmed diagnosis. In many cases, or in many conditions, the completeness of diagnostic information may vary from patient to patient, so in these cases, it's important to establish criteria for classifying cases as definite, probable, and otherwise, especially in registries relying upon on patient reported data. A protocol for implementation of the registry should be developed, including policies and plans for managing the registry, coordinating the data collection efforts, the frequency for requests updated information from registrants, and ensuring ongoing recruitment of new registry participants, as well as retention of existing registry participants. The measures should also be in place to ensure the quality of the data collected. If medical records, lab results, photographs, or other documents are being submitted to the registry, then there will need to be a plan for curation of these records by qualified personnel. There are many important issues to be decided regarding informed consent, data privacy, data ownership. Decisions should be made about how requests for registry data will be handled and how about sharing data with external researchers. I've given you just a brief listing of these issues, but we'll have speakers in our second webinar in October to specifically address these issues and considerations in much greater detail. Of course, an important factor and sometimes a barrier in planning and launching a registry is the budget. Well-designed and implemented registries 
registries are costly to launch, and it's understandable that the hurdle of just getting the registry started is challenging. But the budget for the registry is at the forefront of most of your considerations and concerns. Something that's often overlooked in the planning stage is consideration of how to fund sustainability of the registry over a longer period of time. This is an important issue to think about even in the planning stages because you don't want to go through the effort and expense of setting up a registry with all of the expectations of its future value only to have to abandon it because of lack of funding support. Therefore, it's advisable to consider sources of funding for the future, including public or governmental grant programs, foundations, or partnering with biopharma and or academia. Some registries elect to charge fees to researchers who want access to the registry data, which can be a source of revenue for the registry, but may be less likely to provide a sustained and reliable source of funding. Recently, there's been increasing use of crowdsourcing programs to fund rare disease research projects. And this type of fund fundraising format may, may be worth exploring as well. Ultimately, a long-term funding stream is critical to maintaining and growing a registry and to maximizing both the upfront and the longer-term investments in the registry. There are many examples of registries that collected data over one or a few years but failed to successfully develop a long-term funding stream, and ultimately they went dormant and probably fell short of, of expectations. So this is not to say that you cannot begin a registry until you've secured long-term funding. But in my experience, registries that have considered these issues early on have a greater likelihood of securing funding, meeting the longer-term goals of the registry, and bringing the maximum benefit to their patient community. A registry is essentially a large database with a user-friendly interface. In order to implement your registry, you'll need to select a platform provider to host and maintain this database and implement all of the necessary security and data capture issues. There are a number of platforms currently available, including the Patient Crossroads Connect program, Genetic Alliance's Rich for All, Patients Like Me, and the Sanford Court Registry. These aren't the only platforms available, but are some of the major ones that serve the rare disease community. Additionally, both the NIH Office of Rare Disease Research and NORD are currently working on open platforms and resources for registries and natural history studies that will be available at some time in the relatively near future, and which you'll hear more about from our next two speakers. And finally, there's always the option of, to utilize a custom design platform if you have the resources and technological support required to do this. Each of these platforms has its own strengths, limitations, and associated costs. In our second webinar, we've invited speakers from several of the platform providers who will present an overview of their platform and discuss the pricing and requirements for maintaining a registry using their platform. Once all stakeholders have agreed on the registry goals, the budget, the policies, and platform, the data collection tools can be designed. Data collection tools, one or more questionnaires that will be asked of the, of the patients or their proxies or clinicians participate in the registry. At least one questionnaire will need to be designed that participants will complete when they register themselves. If the registry design allows, additional questionnaires may also be designed to collect information on registry participants over time or to collect specific information that may be relevant to only a subset of registrants, such as patients with certain comorbidities or sex-specific or mutation-specific disease issues. Guidance should be obtained from the Advisory Committee on Designing the Questionnaires, and it's recommended that they be designed by professionals trained in proper questionnaire design and survey research such as epidemiologists or psychometricians. It's very important to have experienced professionals involved because fundamental design errors can lead to data that may be incapable of, pro of properly answering the research question. As an example, my company was asked to help analyze the data from a registry for a rare genetic pediatric disease. Unfortunately, it turned out that the registry did not capture data on family relationships correctly and included poorly worded questions and answer response options. And as a result, it severely limited the ability of the data from this registry to answer the questions that were of interest to the stakeholders. When designing questionnaires, it's important to balance the data collection needs with the impacts that having a lengthy or burdensome questionnaire might have on people's willingness to participate and on the completeness of the data they're willing to provide. It's advisable to make registering as streamlined as possible in order to maximize registration. So it's important to distinguish what data you must collect from the data that you would like to collect. 
And we'll hear more about this issue from our final speaker today. Finally, when designing data collection tools, it's important to realize that there are existing resources available to help standardize the data collected by the registry, and which may facilitate linkage of data across other registries, databases, or biorepositories. Our next two panelists will speak more specifically about the resources that are available to you to assist with designing your data collection tools. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Stephen Groft, the Director of the Office of Rare Diseases Research in the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences at the National Institutes of Health, and recent recipient of an award from NORD for vision and pioneering guidance on behalf of the rare disease patient community. Dr. Groff's major focus is on stimulating research on rare diseases and developing information about rare diseases for healthcare providers and the public. Among his many responsibilities and achievements benefiting the rare disease community, Dr. Groff and his team have been working on establishing common data elements for rare disease registries and mechanisms for linking registry and biorepository data. Today, Dr. Groff will describe patient registry resources and programs offered by the Office of Rare Diseases Research. So, Dr. Groff, you may take it from here. Okay, thank you, and I hope this is coming through all right. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, good. And maybe if you can't see them, it's all the better, just the slides, so that's good. Thank you. Uh, Shira, thank you for doing an excellent job of, of introducing the topic and, and providing a nice summary. I should just end here, and uh, uh, thank you for for what you've done, uh, putting this, this, this webinar together. And I want to also thank the Global Genes and Rare Project for sponsoring the webinar. Uh, it is a, a subject with a, a tremendous amount of interest, and it is growing as we go on. Um, I also uh, would like to thank uh, Jaffa Rubenstein from our office, who has the lead here in the Office of Rare Diseases Research uh, in this pilot project along with uh, uh, Kyle Brown from Patient Crossroads and Lisa Eisen from Lockheed Martin uh, Company and also uh, Jim Blagaish and, and, and his staff and, and all the staffs involved with the, the organization. Jim is with our IT office here uh, at, the, at the NCATS uh, uh, Center and uh, has been very, very helpful in continuing um, the emphasis on, on this uh, activity and uh, we hope that we, we will be able to continue this uh, through the even after the pilot project, which is scheduled to be completed at the end of uh, an end of September, so I, if, if I have the next slide, please. <clears throat> yeah, I, since I don't have control of this, I'll, I'll just provide a little bit of an overview of the of the GRDR pilot project. And many of you have seen these slides, and so I don't want to go through all of them because really, many of the important aspects are what is to come in the future. Uh, since we have passed through uh, several of these. Uh, several of these already uh, that uh, we, we've in, in the development uh, stages of it all. And I'm going to remove the question from my slide. Okay, thank you. Um, so basically, we, we were trying to uh, collect data from new patient registries and existing registries uh, uh, to try to aggregate that data from multiple registries in a standardized manner. And this has always been a problem with rare diseases where you might have multiple registries and multiple natural history studies going on at the same time, but they're not really organized that well and they, they don't uh, talk uh, to them to each other as they go on. So we're, our goal is to share this information and try to conduct uh, cross disease and hopefully end up with uh, the ability to recruit more patients into studies and to gain a much better understanding uh, of the rare disease itself. A, a major issue with so many rare disorders that we just don't have a, an adequate understanding of the disease itself. And in so doing, uh, we felt, and, and others I think have agreed, that we need to utilize common data elements and even very disease-specific questions uh, and to try to standardize them as much as possible, but yet give the flexibility to introduce into the discussion and, and the questions, new questions, new ideas based on the recommendations coming from the uh, the leadership of the patient advocacy groups that are involved. Uh, part of this also is to utilize the, the GUI, uh, the Global Unique Identifier, uh, to, uh, to, to, to provide information um, on the biosystem 
specimen samples that are to be collected and also to enable us to track uh, patients across numerous studies that we would have one identif identifier for all of these patients. And uh, so uh, this has been uh, created and we will have access to this, uh, this system that we'll make available to everyone who will go about the process of developing their own patient registry uh, utilizing uh, open source web-based software uh, that we are in the process of developing as, as a patient registry template. Uh, so this is something that will be coming very shortly. Uh, we are working through the beta testing of this and we're ready to expand the beta testing now to more, more individuals. We also have a part of the project, uh, the uh, integration of electronic health records into the GRDR. We realize that this is a, a totally separate area that, that needs to be addressed and um, We've been working with the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, Chris Forrest, and, uh, and, and the group up there to uh, really make this happen and, and provide uh, the experience that we need to help guide us in the future when the electronic health records or electronic medical records will become the standards for many, many more people here in the United States and around the world. And all of this, of course, is based on the collaborations um, <clears throat> with the patient advocacy groups, the industry, and the NIH institutes and centers as we go along. Um, we are in the process of developing data contribution and data access agreements that will be available to everyone uh, from the website. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just a little bit of a schematic uh, to talk about the need for patient registries, and I'm not going around this to sort of, uh, uh, yeah, it, it was reversed here from my slides, so I'll try to go. Uh, uh, from left to right on the screen. Uh, and, and if you start with the patient registry and go down to the natural history studies, that space in uh, among those three uh, points there are really the areas that, that we're not doing a very good job or we should be doing a better job of uh, as we move forward. And we, we need to do a much better job. I would say if we're able to complete these, these tasks and, and, and these issues, uh, address these issues, appropriately, we want a very smooth flow of patient identification and, and uh, to enable and improve the patient recruitment and also to expand the knowledge base for rare diseases. So the, the first three points there are really the, the major ones that we're looking at. From there on, as you go around the circle, you can see we do have considerable experience in generating research hypotheses, both in clinical and, and basic research. Uh, we pretty much now understand how to test drugs and, 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 and uh, medical devices, uh, biologics in small patient populations. That has been, been pretty well shown and people are very comfortable with it. And we realize that if, er if all goes well, we're going to end up uh, with uh, an approval uh, after the evaluations have been conducted and the studies have been conducted that it will go to FDA or EMA if, if you're from Europe or other regulatory agencies around the world. Uh, and a very good chance that uh, there's a phase four post-approval study uh, that will be required to follow the patients for a certain period of time, usually looking for uh, certain parameters, whether it be a, a, a liver function test or, or kidney or lung function that we have to monitor because of any possibility of, of toxicity occurring when we get it out into a larger patient population. So we know that, and so it essentially brings us back to the, uh, the patient registry, the contact registry. So we've gone full circle, starting off with patients, and in all likelihood, we will end up uh, back at, at, that, uh, at that patient registry or uh, some registry that we have to follow patients uh, continuously. So um, that's why we sort of try to explain the need for patient registries and natural history studies, that, that they are essential for rare diseases research. Uh, next slide, please. These are the benefits, and I, I, I believe the slides will remain available for your use if, if you can download them. But uh, we've talked about these, the benefits to the patients and, and the patient advocacy groups, the foundations, uh, the industry, the researchers and academia, and the government. And uh, I, I think it's just sort of understood that we can really begin to organize our, our patient um, uh, and their f patients and families uh, to become ready to participate in clinical trials. Even if there is no product on the horizon, it is good to start these registries as early as possible 
even as, as you begin to look at, um, at, at and, and, and contact patients um, uh, from the internet or from, from phone calls, uh, begin to gather information that's systematic fashion. Right now, many of us uh, collect information uh, just on contact information, and we certainly need more than that as, as we go forward. And we think we'll have the tools in the very near future uh, to begin to collect this data uh, in, in a much better fashion than what we do. Um, of course, with the industry, it, it, they, uh, the registry information and natural history studies will be very, very important as far as identifying potential patients to participate in studies, but also to identify information about the disease that, that could actually separate uh, uh, the, the disease information from uh, any effect of the drug, and that, that is always important important when it goes uh, and, and when the, the regulatory uh, arm of, uh, of the government looks at, at, at the, the information, is, it, is what is happening, is it related to the drug uh, or is it a, uh, a part of the disease process? And right now for most diseases, we don't have that good information. So I think you can see the value of conducting the natural history studies or longitudinal studies over a long period of time that we're able to differentiate that. Uh, th those, those features, uh, so very, very important as we move forward. So I would just uh, go on then to the, the next slide, please. Uh, and you can see here how to submit the data, uh, the various types of data that, that will be submitted to the GRDR that we'll be able to accept, and uh, information from biospecimens, from clinical findings, from genetic test results, medical images, and uploading files, so you can see uh, it would be a tremendous amount of storage space that is required as we go forward. Uh, and so now we, we've jumped onto the common data elements. Uh, next slide is okay, moving into the common data elements, thank you. Uh, there, at the NIH, uh, there is a group of uh, uh, institutes that are working on this issue. I would recommend you, you look at, at, at that, uh, that website to find the various uh, questions and data elements that you might be able to employ in your uh, your efforts to develop the patient registries, and, and this is a growing uh, list of information. We hope uh, in the future that we can uh, not only provide that information, but be able to accept that information from you as you look at your registries and as you work with your uh, medical and scientific advisors that you provide that information back in into us that we can improve then the data elements and the standardized questions that will be utilized. So, uh, so please check it out and, and uh, look at that. And if you've got questions or suggestions, let us know or the other. So if I can move on to the next slide, please. So talking a little bit about the scientific and clinical value of the GRDR, and this is really uh, most of the, uh, the patient registries. We really are trying to integrate the patient reported clinical data from multiple sources into a single repository. It doesn't mean that there will be just one repository um, and, and, or one registry uh, that is created, but we, we would like to be able to capture de-identified information uh, to come into one repository. We can then uh, really get a much better picture of the diseases, and uh, really that's sort of what we're uh, moving into as far as stimulating new research as, as we look at at, at the data, and we, we do some analysis of data uh, across diseases, and as, as we gather information, not from 10 or 15 or 20, but hundreds, if not thousands, of patients from around the world, that we really can get a much better picture of the of the uh, the disease and the, the patients, and and what also what what they might be using uh, or how they're coping uh, with the rare diseases. Um, so it, it gives us the opportunity uh, to mine the data. Um, in a much better sense with more patients uh, available, more patient information available, and this will provide us new insights into the rare diseases. Uh, the, the common data elements that will be developed uh, should be uh, available for use by any patient registry and for the, uh, uh, the GRDR, and there is a library of disease-specific questions that I mentioned that, that we are developing, uh, that, and that is readily available to the public. Um, we have developed an informed consent template for participants to use and for you to use in developing registries. And uh, as I mentioned, the open source software patient registry template is, is coming uh, very soon. Uh, we're making some great progress, but it, it has been a, 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 a 
long haul and a difficult stretch uh, getting through many requirements, some of which are, are related to being a government uh, agency organization uh, creating such a uh, such a, a data repository and a, a general patient registry, which, um, as we know with the government requirements, we have to adhere to them too. So um, a little bit slower than what we had thought, but, but we think we'll, we'll meet our goals of uh, opening it up, and then we, we plan to extend it for another uh, period of time to be able to capture that information and give us more information uh, with real-life experiences with this. Okay, next slide, please. So the next step. Uh, again, we ask everyone to consider using uh, the common data elements and integrate the specific questions for their diseases into the patient registries. Um, we would like uh, the organizations to consider contributing this de-identified patient data to the GRDR from the registries uh, that are developed by the patient organizations, the academic researchers, and the biopharmaceutical industry, the major players in, what, uh, in the creation of patient registries, along with the uh, the various providers of registries uh, that, that Shira mentioned in one of her slides. Um, so we, we feel also that with the patient registry, like so many other aspects of rare diseases, uh, that collaboration which is established uh, through this, this pr uh, process, whether it's physician-entered data or patient-entered data or electronic health record data, that we're going to be able to bring the patients and the practitioners together, the clinicians together, much better than what we have in the past and facilitate the collaboration. And at some point, I think we'll see in the research process uh, the ability to have many, uh, not just as we now have one or two research sites or multiple research sites, five or ten, but actually many, many more uh, opportunities to enlist, uh, enroll patients into the studies from, from the local uh, clinician site and, and their, their practice. And uh, that would certainly facilitate the, the problem travel. Uh, right now, there is no established forum for sharing the experiences, uh, especially for the registry developers. Uh, many people are approaching this problem, uh, and what we're trying to avoid is every time a registry is developed, you know, we're starting all over again using a different platform. And so I think what we're trying to do is, is, is bring some standards to the area of patient registries and uh, have the people begin talking with each other. I think this is one of our goals, is to uh, provide a forum, and if others are, are willing to, to join in this effort, uh, we're looking forward to doing this. Uh, of course, training webinars will be required, and I do ask everyone to look at the ICD-10 nomenclature, the beta uh, phase website for rare diseases, uh, to make sure your diseases are adequately represented. As we all know, in, in anything with, with our registry development, um, the, the most appropriate terminology is very, very important that we adhere to. So uh, please take a look at that and, and uh, see if your disease uh, disorders are, are represented appropriately. Uh, next one, please. Next slide. So the future needs, uh, the, the registries and the future needs that we're looking at are, uh, and we've talked about this, the acceptance, the development common, uh, acceptance of common data elements uh, by the developers and, and the other parties here. Uh, we, and above all, we have to maintain the data security and patient privacy guarantees essential if we want this to be ex, uh, acceptable uh, uh, to everyone involved. Uh, so it is very, very important. Um, we, we need to also to make sure that there is integration of the patient clinical data with the biospecimen sample so that we do get a good picture of the disorder that, that, uh, that goes along with the, the, the sample that is available for further research. Uh, we talked about having sources and tools for data collection, storage, and, and access to information across common uh, platforms. And I think many of us will be able to share our experiences as we go along here in the not too distant future with, with uh, these processes. Um, again, data aggregation and analysis of de identified data is very, very important. Uh, how do we do this? Uh, and, and there will be opportunities to express these, uh, these differences too as we go along. And we ask uh, individuals who are developing registries to make sure that they are registered within the AHRQ registry, patient registries or ROPAR. So please check out that. Uh, and also uh, what is available and coming from the PCORI Institute, uh, Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, uh, some very nice programs coming out of there uh, that we're um, that we, we ask people to, to really be aware of, of what the opportunities are. 
and especially as we begin to consider moving into the GRDR2, which is sort of what we said that we would gain this experience and then begin uh, uh, with the pilot project and then to, to look for the best ways to move into uh, the next uh, version of the GRDR. Uh, and uh, we are starting to look at this now that as we're moving into the pilot project. So, uh, next slide, please. Okay, I just want to, to mention um, two other aspects. One is RD Connect. This is an EU European Union funded project uh, led by Hans Lachmuir, and uh, we are working with them and many others. I know Kyle is working with them, and, and hopefully some of, of the other people on the phone also. Uh, are collaborating with with the folks from the European Union and around the world. We actually built up a very nice network of interested individuals and organizations uh, to connect the registries, biobanks, and and, uh, and information for the rare diseases. And uh, this is something that I think is very very important. And uh, we actually have been considering this for about three or four years now, working on this, and and it came to fruition with with a grant award to Hans Lockmuir from the European uh, Union last. Uh, last year. So uh, next slide I think is just a, a de uh, depiction of, of the steps involved with a global rare disease patient registry uh, in repository. You may have seen this in some of our slides. Yoff has used this uh, a, a number of times. I've used it also to sort of show the flow of how everything works with, um, uh, with the patient registry with the GRDR uh, pilot project that we're looking at. So. With that, I will end it and uh, turn it back over to Shiva. Um, so I think that will be it. Thank you. And I'll, I'll wait to questions and uh, following the end of all the presentations. Great. Well, Dr. Groff, thank you so much for your very valuable uh, uh, participation and uh, presentation. And uh, so, uh, and just a word to the participants, please continue to submit your questions, which we will address at the end uh, of all the formal presentations. So next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Marshall Summer. At the Children's National Medical Center, Dr. Summer is Chief of the Division of Genetics and Metabolism, Margaret O'Malley Chair of Molecular Genetics, and Director of the Clinical Research Center. Dr. Summer is an international expert on errors of metabolism, and he's one of the founding investigators of the Urea Cycle Disorders Consortium. His research involves translational studies to develop clinical applications from basic molecular genetics research and he's currently involved in multiple clinical trials aimed at improving the outcomes of patients using compounds from the metabolic pathways he studies. Today, Dr. Summer will be speaking about natural history as a critical component of patient registry. Welcome, Dr. Summer. Thank you so much, Dr. Kramer. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear I you. you. Outstanding, outstanding. Um, well, I'd like to meet that guy you just introduced, but you're stuck with me. And I'm greetings from uh, Washington's Ronald Reagan Airport. And if I could please uh, have the next slide. All right, so what I want to talk about a little bit is some of the practical aspects of the last two excellent talks you had. Those were great roadmaps for what we should be doing with rare diseases, where we should be heading with trying to develop registries. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, standardized longitudinal natural history studies and my involvement in those, how we've gone about identifying key outcome measures for um, both pharma studies as well as patient outcome studies, uh, quantifying effects for clinical trial power calculations, how these serve to organize communities of patients as well as communities of clinicians and scientists. There's a lot of spinoff effects that way. How they can organize the community of pharma and investors too. So a field of dreams model, if you build it, they will come. And uh, also how it can provide standards for data collection, formatting, et cetera. The GRDR project that Dr. Groff just talked about is absolutely you know, the way we need to go with this. We need common elements and everything else. Uh, next slide. So just remember, obviously, this is a rare disease um, registry talk. They are rare. Patients are hard to come by. They're also easy easily exhausted and they can actually be overstudied if you're not careful. So that's one of the things we always try to keep in mind when we're doing these studies. Typically you're going to be doing a lot of the work with an academic medical setting, particularly doing physician data entry simply because that's where these patients tend to go, that's where they tend to get their care and follow up. Uh, also historically large sets of natural history information don't exist on these patients. 
Um, one of the things you often find when you're trying to design a clinical trial or trying to design an outcome study, or even trying to design a testable hypothesis, is it's hard to know exactly what the incidence of the particular outcome you're looking at is, how often does it happen. So one of the things that these registries and natural history studies can do is help seed the population and seed the information pool that you need to actually move this field forward. Uh, next slide, please. Definitions are important. The only reason I bring this up is there's sometimes some confusion. The uh, European Union tends to use the term registry um, interchangeably with natural history study. In the U.S., you'll see uh, it used several ways. One is a contact registry, which is almost more of a glorified phone book. And then we also are starting to use the term registry for longitudinal studies, but you'll also see longitudinal natural history study used in the U.S. too. If I use the term registry today, it's when I'm referring to a natural history study for patients. Next slide, please. Uh, as you know, Dr. Groff has a busy job. He has to list over 7,300 some odd rare diseases. Um, redesigning and collecting databases for each of these will actually be incredibly wasteful. I think that's one of the reasons we're trying to get some standardization in the process. But excellent parent and family organizations that exist for most of these diseases and can be incredibly helpful for what you're trying to do. But as I said again, a lot of the key outcomes um, are not known for these diseases. A lot of what gets built into the literature and common knowledge is usually from the first case report series from these disorders. And those case reports may or may not reflect the broader population pool. So you always have to go back and test your assumptions and look again and again at what's actually common. Next slide, please. All right, such efforts. Obviously, we just talked about the GRDR from the NIH. Um, the NIH Disease uh, Research Network, which I'm a part of, is 17 rare disease groups that um, we have ongoing registries. We're actually in year eight right now. These are investigator initiated as opposed to patient data entry standards. Um, it's part of the NIH Standard Registries Project. We also have a lot of interaction with the National Organization for Rare Diseases for these, and also NORD has a project that we're working on for creating a patient and family entered data uh, in a very good way, but that actually is one of those things, once again, where design is the key element for making those work. And there are lots and lots of groups out here working on these things. I think, obviously, pulling the community together is a big thing we want to do. Next slide. So key issues for pharma, for those of you on the phone there. Um, one of the things you want to try to make sure is if you're running a longitudinal natural history study that that data is going to be acceptable to the FDA. Uh, for determining clinical outcomes. Also, when you're designing a natural history, who owns the data? Something that needs to be established beforehand. I think the steps Dr. Kramer lined out earlier are absolutely perfect for that. Housing, legacy issues, cost, IRB, administration, who's going to run it, who's going to keep things going. Uh, and buying by the clinical and the patient stakeholders. These are all things that you need to kind of line up before you actually get into this field. Next slide, please. Oh, did I lose you? Yeah. Hello? Ah, thank you. So let me give you a case study. So the Rare Disease Clinical Research Network Consortium I've been involved with in circles around urea cycle disorders. It's funded by a combination of the NIH grant and philanthropy. We're one of the 17 RDCRN sites. Just to show you how successful these can be, during our eight-year lifespan, we've had three drugs FDA approved, um, bringing them all the way through the process. So and we're talking about fewer than 800 patients, um, and only about five to 600 of them in the registry for this. So that's actually a pretty good track record, all things considered. Next slide, please. So what are urea cycle disorders? There are defects in nitrogen metabolism that in newborns can result in the buildup of ammonia, which of course is neurotoxic. Um, these are what I would call a medium rare condition. We actually were able to use some of our registry data as well as combining it with newborn screening data to come up with an incidence of roughly, roughly one in 35,000. About 1,000 patients in the United States are on treatment for these conditions. Basic problem, you can't break down ammonia. Um, we benefited from having a strong and single-family organization that was key 
and we were partnering um, for the NIH for our Rare Disease Clinical Research Network. Also, the physicians in our field have been in there a long time. We were one of the early players in the Orphan Drug Act, as well as one of the early players in many of the rare disease community issues. So we had a long track record. We could all sort of stand to be in room with each other, too, over long periods of time. And that actually is important when you're putting these types of projects together. Next slide, please. Okay, this is one of the These are all some of our patients with urea cycle disorders. I have permission to show their photos. These are all kids that untreated would be dead, but actually with um, some of the therapies that have been developed in the 1980s, 1990s, 2000s, and even recently, these patients are actually doing quite well. Next slide. So how did we start? We started when... Um, a pharmaceutical company approached us in the 1990s about the need for consensus on clinical treatment, and they asked us what we could do. So we actually asked them if they would find a consensus meeting. We all got together. They didn't end up becoming the nucleus for our NIH study group later on, and it was been clinician run since that time. Uh, the researchers and the clinicians in the field were in the same group. That was actually a real um, benefit so far to us, and it's actually been a really kind of a neat thing. Like I said, we can stand to be in the room for each other for a long time. Um, that's one of the things you want to do when you're putting your team together. We also realized after our first consensus meeting back in 2000 that we really didn't know enough about not only how to treat the patients, but what was happening to the patients, and even some of what the needs were. And what we found is when you look at these groups in depth, you find things that you never expected. So one of the things we always recommend when you're building a rare disease registry is maintain a sense of mental flexibility. You're going to find things. You're going to need to look at things you didn't know you needed to look at. So we knew we needed to do a better job and get better information. So when the Rare Disease Clinical Research Network came along, we knew that would be actually a really neat way to go forward. Next slide, please. What we learned is you don't know enough about the patients. That's kind of just an emphasis on what I've already said. That's one of the things you have to go in with this. If you already knew everything about the patient group you were doing, you could pretty much uh, not skip the registry and launch to the natural history step, but we don't know enough about these. So that's one of the things you have to keep in mind in your design. Next slide, please. All right, beginning with the end in mind. This is a great quote from Stephen Covey I like to use. Um, figure out what it is you want the registry to do. For ours, it was to develop a better understanding of outcomes of urea cycle disorders. We also wanted to do clinical trials. We knew that we didn't have the drugs we needed or the treatments we needed to take care of our patients. We've been looking at neural protection, new ways to challenge ammonia, lots of different things. I think we have something like 12 different ongoing trials um, with both new therapeutic models and other things in our registry. You need to develop resources and centers of excellence. Simply by organizing around centers where people take care of these patients, you improve overall care and can actually show you some data on that. The next thing that you can bring along the next generation of investigators, we've actually now on our third generation of scientists who have entered the urea cycle disorders field and are now running their own programs and are members of our network. And then you can also figure out what it was you didn't know. For instance, in urea cycle disorders, we found out that a lot of our patients were developing pulmonary hypertension until we started collecting data we didn't even have a clue that that was going on with them. Next slide, please. All right. So location, location, location. If you look at a nighttime map of the United States, you can see where most of the folks are. And since rare diseases tend to cluster when there's lots of folks, we found that's where most of our sites would be. Next slide. And then you can skip directly to the next one. So our sites are all across the United States. Um, we have multiple studies. Continue on, please. So here's one of the things we noticed. So when we look at um, one-year and five-year survivals in urea cycle patients, and a study from Japan in pre-1999, uh, one-year survival was 43%, five years was 22, France was 26, with very few surviving the five years. Um, and then in the FDA study of some of the drugs available in the field already, the 
the one-year survival was 68%, the five-year was 55%. The next line down is actually shows kind of some of the power of what you can do just by kind of organizing without really bringing in any significantly new models of treatment and just, just getting it organized and coming up with better therapeutic protocols. We're now running a 97% one-year survival for neonatal patients and about 96% on five years. We keep reassessing that, and you know, we'll see if it goes up or down some. But we do feel that just the organizational process has actually been beneficial for the patients. Next slide, please. This is an old slide that I've purposefully antiqued from Saul Brusillo's collection. This shows what happens to urocycle patients who are in a hyperammonemic coma in the newborn period. The longer they're in a coma, the lower their IQ score. By two to three days, almost all patients have an IQ below 50 long term as far as how they're doing from their outcomes. So not only were we interested in having a higher survival rate in our patients, we wanted to have a better quality of life. Next slide, please. We've been tracking how we've been doing since the 1990s. So one of the things you'll notice on this slide, for patients 17 to adult, these are patients who were diagnosed before um, we organized our treatment protocols before we organized our data collection, organized our sense. Uh, the 6 to 16 patients, those are the ones where we were just getting started, the 3 to 5s, where we've been doing better, and the under 3s are our most recent batch. And what we found in this data is continuing to hold up. If patients do have stable IQs, they're not deteriorating, um, is that uh, we seem to be getting better neurological outcomes in addition to higher survival rate. So, one of my pitches I'd like to make here is these things are worth doing just for the understanding of the diseases, but there is actually a process of the ob just being in the observer position and just also being organized that really does improve and help with patient care. Next slide, please. So, for those of pharma members in the audience or people who are interested in this particular, if you will, that they will come. What we found is that when we had a well-organized registry with good longitudinal data, um, three companies actually approached us about doing FDA trials with them, and the system is set up such that we can do that. We also have device developments underway. We have two new drug trials underway. We've got spinoffs to two other rare disease groups and two common conditions as a result of the studies done from here. So I think you can say that you do tend to get some payoff for what you're doing from these uh, particular disease groups. Um, this has also led to some funding for our consortium because we are conducting post-marketing studies. We also uh, do have to charge somewhat for access to our data and patient populations um, for that. So you can actually work this as a model for some sustainability as well. Next slide, please. All right, why should pharma come? So that's a good question. Why not build your own? Well, one thing the patients are pretty concentrated. If they're centered around the areas of excellence, you're already going to have most of the key opinion leaders in um, in your pocket or in in the organization already. You can significantly shorten the time to approval. Three drugs over an eight-year window, I think, shows that, and it's been pretty easy to do. It also means that you can more accurately pick your key outcome variables, both from the access to expert opinion, but also the data in the registry itself. We'll tell you how common things are and what things you might be able to move. And then you've got the pre existing data on natural history that you can use in designing clinical trials. The other thing is the families and the patient organizations are already involved and already identified, and the people who participate in these registries are folks who are incentivized to go on and try to make their lives better um, for their other patients. And your participants are well incentivized. Next slide, please. Lessons we learned. So these are things that I would say more of a practical nature. The first thing is a good data coordinator is more precious than platinum. One of the things you have to identify is someone with the skill set to help you organize this, get the data in, and make sure it's good. Physicians mean well, but physicians typically are not the best at keeping these data sets up. So you have to have a good organization person. The other thing is what I call the law of additive optimism. There are never as many patients will enroll as you think. We originally thought we had 1,200 patients with urea cycle, ended up with about 550. And I think this is true across most of the rare disease networks I've worked with. Um, think adaptive trial statistics. 
on patients that serum controls, crossover models. The classic randomized clinical trial is very difficult to do for these patients. So you're going to have to think of different ways to do it. There are lots of new statistical models for this. A lot of these have been worked out through the Rare Disease Clinical Research Network. The other thing is paperwork is always the right limiting step. I think as Dr. Groff alluded, many of the regulations and hurdles you have to jump are oftentimes the things that slow down these registries the most. Um, IRBs or institutional review boards are a big thing for slowing these things down. Um, one of the things we'd love to see pushed for is national IRB for rare disease. Um, more centers, the more centers you add, the more paperwork you end up with, the more IRBs you have to do, but that's the price of doing rare disease work. And academic medical center contracting agents, which you have to deal with every time you add a new center, can be challenging. So these are always issues you have to think about. If you plan for them on the front end, at least you won't be surprised. Another thing that we learned is treatment does standardize. We found that across our centers, once we started comparing notes, we did a better job of getting our patients together. And then having a long-standing standardized database will make comparisons with other disease groups possible as well. We've actually been able to foster the formation of a European uh, intoxicating metabolic disease group, which mirrors our data collection. In fact, we use the same data elements that we're collecting for uh, urea cycles in the European Union. So we suddenly double the number of patients we'll be able to look at long term. Next slide. What pharma has to deal with when they're thinking about these? One thing to remember is exclusive ownership of data is infeasible. So when you're working with rare disease groups, when you're working with academic institutions, the comfortable model of being able to control your own data isn't always possible. In small groups, you can get single disruptive individuals, and they can have a disproportionate effect, and you need to try to identify those folks going in. We fortunately were very lucky not to have that problem, but I've certainly seen many groups founder on that sort of thing. Remember that if you are coming into this, the clinical trial isn't the sole focus for many of these families and patients. It's actually the natural history and the long-term focus of finding out what goes on with the disease. The other thing to remember is academics and patient groups will wiggle you for more money. Researchers are like teenagers. We always need money and we'll always ask for it. Next slide, please. Some suggestions. Check your ego at the door. Um, you're going to have to work with a lot of people very close up. Collect data that you can consistently get. The biggest problem I'll see is over design. I come from the state of Tennessee with a great freight there. Never put two tons of fertilizer in a one ton truck. And it's certainly true when you're designing your database and what types of things you want to collect. Spend time defining what the criteria are for having a disease. This is something you have to do on the front end. This can often be much harder than you think when you try to come up with objective criteria. Plan for opening new sites and closing unproductive ones. Go ahead and build this into your bylaws. It's something you're going to end up needing to do. The other thing you have to avoid is the use of the word my. You think of both the data, the patients, and everything else. Uh, it's a good place to learn sharing. And fortunately, since a lot of the people in the rare disease field are pediatricians, it's not quite as bad as it might be elsewhere. Next slide. So I want to just speak briefly about the current ongoing NORD project, that's National Organization of Rare Disease. This is a project we're doing in concert with the CTSA NIH team, the FDA team, as a way to come up with any patient data entered registry that uses common data elements. We're working obviously with GRDR to make sure we adapt those, but also um, avoid the expense of an academic based registry natural history study. Um, for instance, our urea cycle disorder has over $10 million spent on it so far, and you simply cannot do 7,000 different diseases with registry for each one doing it using that model. Um, we're going to be doing data housing at NORD for this project, which we're sort of using as a model of Switzerland since NORD is a fairly nonpartisan group for this. Common data elements, obviously, entry by patient and families, with also the ability to have medical professionals enter this via the web. We're working with the Clinical Translational Science Board Center, the CPSAs, um, using a REDCap database system, which is a national open source system for funding NIH organizations for these clinical trials or organizations. Data ownership will be by the disease organizations, but also options will be built in for partnering, and also legacy design will be built into that, so we'll have sort of a standard data 
agreement that these groups will be using for this. We're pushing very hard for common IRB nationally. And uh, we actually, our pilot rollout is this year, and we currently have two groups that we've already done um, tracking and um, opening up their databases for. So this is very exciting. We're looking forward to seeing how this project goes forward. Obviously, we want to make sure that we work with the other agencies that are doing this already. Next slide, please. How do you expand this? Um, like I said, from our Nord project, and I think also from uh, Dr. Groff's GRDR, the reason a lot of the work is we learn from the Rare Disease Clinical Research Network. Um, our biggest difference for ours is patient family entry rather than study site entry. Uh, and a lot of this has to do with both the economics, but you also can get good data quality if the design is done properly, and I think that's something Dr. Kramer can definitely speak to. Um, Norm is going to be providing this as a service to its member organizations, and then um, one of the things we've been working closely is with the FDA is to make sure that the design of these databases provides data that's already acceptable for the FDA for clinical trials. Um, so these will be designed eventually for doing partnering with pharma researchers, regulatory bodies, and others. Next slide, please. This is just a slide from our website for our Rare Disease Clinical Research Network. This just kind of shows the sorts of things you can do. We have treatment guidelines on here, information for physicians, participating clinical centers. These are all things that will help pull your community together. Just a dry database isn't going to be enough to do it. One of the things that we strongly recommend is that you build some form of dashboarding into your disease and registry collection so that families, patients, and physicians can actually go to the site periodically, see how many patients are in, see what some of the trends in the field are. This obviously you know, won't be data that it reveals who patients are, but it kind of shows the overall trend, and it's a great incentivizer for folks to participate. And on that, I actually, as all I've got for you for today, um, greetings from Washington, D.C., and please feel free to forward any questions. Unfortunately, I have to get on a plane now, so I'll have to log off in just a second, but I certainly appreciate this opportunity. Dr. Kramer, thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much, Dr. Sommer, for your excellent presentation, and have a safe trip. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> so I think we're going to go on now. I just a quick note: uh, we, uh, our final speaker, uh, Megan O'Boyle, will uh, will take it from here. But I want to just remind the participants to please continue to submit your questions. We will probably not have any time at the end to address them today, but I will either uh, pass them along to the appropriate speaker or we will address them uh, during our second uh, webinar in October. So with that, I'd like to introduce Megan O'Boyle, who is a member of the Board of Directors of the Feeling McNichter Syndrome Foundation. Megan is an active advocate for rare disease and autism spectrum disorder registries the IRB process for rare diseases and involving the rare disease community in research. And recently, she coordinated the collection of biosamples at the Phelan McDermott Foundation 2012 Family Conference. And the resulting lymphoblastoid cell lines, DNA, and fibroblasts are now all available through the National Institute of Mental Health Stem Cell Center. She spent the past several years planning, designing, and serving as registry coordinator for the Phelan McDermott Syndrome International Registry. And today she'll be discussing some of her experiences, lessons learned, and recommendations. So, Megan? Good afternoon, and thank you every, um, for having me and for everybody's attention at this time of day. Uh, I know it's tough, so I start with the, the first slide, which is PMS, it's not what you think. Um, next slide. Phelan McDermott syndrome um, has the initials PMS, and as with many rare diseases, you end up with your initials. So um, we're going to try and make lemonade out of lemons. Um, in terms of Phelan McDermott syndrome and a snapshot, um, these are various patients uh, with Phelan McDermott syndrome. The spectrum can be quite wide, um, and as with many rare diseases, as as you increase the number of patients, the spectrum of symptoms can become wider. Um, so we've got beautiful kids. Next, next slide, please. Uh, if you were to, to look at a fish, you'd see on the 22nd chromosome that um, for a child like mine, there would be a piece missing. That's the end of the 22nd chromosome. Um, there are mosaicisms and, and rings as well. Next slide, please. 
So more pictures of our beautiful kids. Um, the phenotype, uh, like I said, can uh, vary, but uh, we have global delays. Uh, our, uh, our patients have global delays, absent delayed speech, um, sleep issues, GI issues, seizures, sensory problems, behaviors, and, and it goes on. Um, so this is why we are, are um, often considered a um, genetic cause of autism because that is how our children present. Next slide, please. We are a 12-year-old nonprofit. Um, we were started by a group of families who were introduced by a um, sighted geneticist, um, and uh, we have a three-person staff in Florida. We do not yet have a scientific director, but we do rely on the advice of our scientific advisory committee. Um, we have members all over the world, and um, we are currently the only family foundation. Um, we are helping families uh, organize in other countries, um, but this has been an incredibly helpful um, helpful thing because we've always had one voice. Um, next slide, please. So for the purpose of today's presentation, um, when I say family, in, for some of you, it would be patient. Um, our patients are, um, at this point, not capable of answering surveys, so their registries are, um, their data is input by family members. Next slide. So what do we offer as a patient organization? And, and this has been said two or three times today already. Well, we have families that we've organized, we meet every two years, and those families trust the foundation and, and what we um, tell them and ask of them, and um, their contact information when they become members of the foundation, uh, and there's no fee for that. We have means of communications. We send out a monthly newsletter. Um, we uh, have emails, um, annual reports, and in the process of registering and in the registry, the families can to be recontacted, and in almost every case, they will consent to be recontacted for our disease. So. Um, that's a fantastic uh, advantage to have, and this gives us the ability to um, inform and recruit patients very quickly. If something were to come to our attention and somebody needed patients with a certain symptom, um, we could do it in a day. Next slide, please. Why should we, as a patient group, sponsor a registry? Um, well, often the the model that people think of is a... Um, I've heard it referred to as a silo um, type thing where there's a researcher in one location asking patients or families a set of questions. Uh, and then there's a researcher in another location that may be asking similar or the same questions. And you know what happens to this data depends on how long the funding and the attention span of the researcher is. And often this data is not um, published or it, it just dies out. So by having a patient foundation-supported registry, um, we are able to decrease this patient fatigue of answering the same questions or similar questions over and over. Um, and we can allow for the data to be shared for um, more, with more people for a lot less money and uh, give researchers all over the world access, not just whoever got funding to ask questions. Um, and this is a huge issue. It allows us to inform our families about what we're learning, and we can do this quickly. And for years, we all answered questionnaires and never saw publications and never found out how we compared with the other registrants of these other uh, silo registries. Um, we can also have the um, ability to, to post questions from uh, researchers that we may not have thought of originally and we have done so. Next slide. So PMSIR is Phelan McDermott Syndrome International Registry, and that is the only registry that is, exists for this um, disease, and we hope to keep it that way. More is not better when it comes to registries for a rare disease. Um, it's best to have everybody putting their information in one place. Um, we collect contact information, which is, is held by the foundation only. We collect genetic reports, which are then curated um, by a trained genetic counselor, and in our case, provided by the, the vendor. We ask 100 
clinical questions, 100 development questions, and we have allowed a researcher to add 100 specific questions. Um, and the way that works is um, they ask the questions, we protect, we protect their data while they data mine it and or publish it, and then that data will eventually become part of our full registry, so all researchers would eventually have access to it. Next. We have informed consent, um, which we re researched and um, looked at very thoroughly, and it's not too long, and it's not too broad, and it's not too specific. And we have um, uh, uh, IRB, which is not internal review board, that's a typo. Uh, and um, that's very important, and I can address some of that later. Next. Uh, the platform that we um, use is called Patients Crossroads. That's what our landing site looks like. Um, we have a glossary and um, Q&A about what registries are and, and what they will do and um, the benefits and costs to it. And we can also um, put up news and eventually we hope to have um, clinical trial recruitment information on there as well. Next. So how do we recruit patients just simply to register? And we, we are able to do that fairly easily because most of um, we have so many people with this rare disease have already joined our foundation. So we use social media and um, we are able to um, market very quickly and effectively through that. Next. Um, as I said, we, we have um, used social media. We've also sponsored a contest. Um, so if everybody answers all their questions, they automatically get in, entered into a contest. And when you have a nonverbal patient population, the best thing that you could win <laughs> is is a um, iPad for our families. So that, that we have a huge increase in registrants when we had a, um, a quick contest last year. Um, the other um, thing is we post statistics um, in our foundation newsletter, which attracts attention to people, and they see that other patients are being compared to each other, and they want to see how their own patient would compare. Next. Um, in terms of follow-up, the patient... Um, Format that we have, the registry format that we have, allows us to target um, communication specifically to people that answer certain questions a certain way. In other words, if you were to answer the question, "Does your family member have seizures?" and the answer was yes, we could then target an email to the people that have answered the seizure question. If we had somebody, a researcher interested in epilepsy, um, this means that we're not over communicating with families that have uh, don't have the same issues. Um, and we can um, do auto uh, communications through the registry as well. You know, it's uh, annual reminders so that we can collect um, every year, um, or just reminders to follow up with finishing questionnaires or attaching genetic reports. Next. So, why do we put all of our eggs in one basket? Um, well, we are young. Young uh, foundation, uh, very rare, and uh, we had little information and little um, interest. Well, we had the interest of the scientific community um, was was growing, um, and very limited resources. But we understood that the registry was the greatest thing that we could do. It would um, help us better understand our, our our syndrome, develop cohorts, validate animal models. Models um, and and understand the natural history, and this is important. In wanting to understand the natural history, that means we need to continue to engage families annually in answering these questions, which means that this needs to be um, the we need to continually look at how we're asking questions and make sure we don't um, overburden our families. Um, and uh, by collecting the patient contact information we will have um, quick and easy ability to recruit patients as needed down the road. Um, and as I said before, it's, it should never be underestimated the importance of educating families and empowering them with information about this syndrome. Next. 
So um, I wish I had Dr. Kramer's um, slides before I started this because she had some fantastic suggestions on what you should do before you get started. Um, and I did not do all those, or we did not do all those things. We did ask for help for those to, from um, rare diseases that already had registries. Unfortunately, three years ago, um, I was shocked to find out that very, very few rare diseases were starting their own registries. They had Their registries, if they had them, were in the hands of a researcher or multiple researchers. Um, so we asked for help. We uh, went to the people that did the earliest work and asked for their help. Um, and we went to other stakeholders, such as Autism Speaks, um, who had um, already established some, some registry questions. And then we also went to our researchers um, mm -hmm. in the areas of each organ um, or symptom. And for instance, if we had questions about uh, renal issues, uh, we would come up with the questions that we thought our patients um, needed to be asked, and then we would pass those questions and answers on to renal researchers in the area of our gene and ask them if this, these questions would glean the information that they wanted. So um, it's good to ask for a lot and uh, of early help. Uh, next slide, please. So who did it? Um, parent volunteers. When I say we, I mean other parents of sick children. Um, and we got a lot of input from our vendor. Um, you just have to keep asking people for help. Next. Okay, so how did we do this? And I, I've touched on this a little bit already, so I'm going to go through this quickly. We researched who had platforms available. We chose somebody. We um, compiled questions and answers, and uh, we ran them by the researchers. We created the necessary documents, um, which Dr. Groft has already explained. There's um, help for that already now with informed consents and things like that. We beta tested with a variety of families. We launched and we marketed and now we are in the process of reassessing and we will do an overhaul this year after two years of collecting data um, so we can improve on what we started. Next. Uh, in terms of pilot testing, um, we did have a number of groups look at our original registry questionnaire or questionnaires. 200 is a lot of questions. I was told to stick with 25 to 50. Um, we had the original researchers look at it, families who were recently diagnosed. So these were young, tech-savvy people who were also very raw and very emotional, and we were able to get their reactions to how we asked questions. We also asked families with diagnoses from years gone by, perhaps less tech-savvy, but uh, more experienced and less emotional and um, had seen the larger gamut of symptoms. Um, next slide, please. So what have we accomplished? Um, in less than two years, we have registered over 620 patients. We only know of 900 um, diagnosed patients in the world that have joined our foundation. So that's a great... Um, a great statistic considering maybe um, many of those are non in, in non-English speaking countries. Um, we did get the questionnaire and all the um, instructions translated into um, three different languages. As I said, we let another we let a researcher post their questions, um, and we've gained the attention of the research community, and we've um, gained registrants from 39 countries. Next, please. And those are the countries. Now, you know, in full disclosure, you'll, you'll, you'll see that many of them may have only had one person register, but it just shows you the, the reach that you can have when you, when you do something like this. Next. Well, uh, what we've learned, um, and um, Dr. Summer had some great lessons as well, um, is that uh, families prefer short, specific questionnaires um, because they don't have a lot of time. Um, they want to be able to come back to questions. They don't want, want to sit down for long periods of time because most of these families can't. They have to take care of kids. Um, that too much is too long is too overwhelming, and that um, families that can't remember the answers to questions from years gone by are um, they're very tough on themselves. They feel like they're bad parents because they can't remember. And so we need to 
take into consideration what type of burden we're putting on the families when we ask questions. Um, and if we really want people to come back every year, we need to make sure that the first experience was a good experience and not too overwhelming. Next slide, please. We've learned that the researchers are incredibly interested in the genetic data and um, that not all the reports that we're getting are as useful as um, the current type of technology that is available um, and that not even the newest technology can tell researchers everything. So we're learning by um, trial and error. Next, please. Uh, we've also learned that families have a hard time finding the reports um, and that um, some families were never given the report or can't find the report um, and that just uploading a report is kind of over, is daunting to a family and they may just never get to it. Um, so again, it's getting the genetic reports was not as easy as we thought it would be. Um, next, please. Um, I explained that having a, a promotion is a great way to get more people in. Next. Um, same thing. That big blue line on the on the left just shows you what happened the, the month that we had the contest uh, for the iPad. We had over 400 people go in and, and um, update their, their questions. Uh, and we had a lot of people join. Um, go ahead. Um, the cost is more in the first year generally because you're you're setting things up, but you always have to remember that there's fees and um, IRB renewals. Um, I did not include the translations in, in here, um, and there is no fee for registry coordinator as I am currently the registry coordinator and I'm a volunteer. Next, please. So funding, this is an easy slide. We need more of it, and we need to go get it. Next. Um, so the patients are getting more information, the researchers are getting more data about the patients, and the pharmaceutical companies will eventually get the data that they need to do more appropriate um, clinical trials. So it's a win-win for everybody. Um, this is the greatest side effect so far, the greatest, um, not side effect, but benefit is that our patients are taking the data that they get from the registry into their doctor's offices into their IEP meetings, and they're showing them that um, you know there's what their child or patient family's need is, and um, this is a lot better than waiting for something to get published years after a study. Next, um, so this just says the same thing that the last one said, <laughs> which is that the patients are using this data immediately, and it's very useful, and it's. Um, now, if a doctor won't believe a mom or a dad, they'll believe a chart, sadly, but true. Uh, next, please. So the, the researchers, I said this earlier, they're getting data from more patients faster for less money, and they're able to recontact the patients for future studies, and um, they can see data that, that um, may not have been of interest to them and they would never have asked about, but since we thought to ask about it, they're seeing correlations that are um, new and exciting. Next. So the um, outcomes have been, um, you know, basically a, we've reached to some extent um, most of our goals to some degree, and um, we've attracted the attention of researchers. We are getting studies. We've, we're developing cohorts, and so the list goes on. Um, so this is all good. Next. Um, what are our plans? We're, as I said, we're going to do an overhaul. We're going to add a, a, a few new surveys for adult patients and about quality of life that will um, help drive some future studies. Uh, we are needing to, to go after outside funding and um, hopefully hire a registry coordinator. Um, I feel strongly about the IRB process um, being revamped in this space. Um, so we're working on that, and um, we're finalizing a research data access policy, which was mentioned earlier. You really do have to think through, um, and it's more complicated than you would think, um, who you're going to give your data to, how fast, uh, does it have to be cleaned up or curated, and um, what are the conditions that they get the data. 
Um, we'll hope to get some more translations and um, celebrate our success. Next. So my advice for patients just starting out, which I imagine is many of the people that have stayed on this call, next, is start now. Um, don't, um, yes, it can be expensive. It doesn't have to be. There are other options other than what we've done, and um, you can't always do things perfectly. Next. Um, collaborate. Collaborate with uh, other p patient groups within your disease. Um, collaborate with um, with whomever you think is a stakeholder. Everybody can bring something um, to the, the table, and it's best to play well with others whenever you can. And next. Um, you can't improve what you haven't started. So as I said, start now. Um, start asking questions, start asking for help. Next. And this has been told to me twice in the last month, so I think it's worthy of being told to you. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, you want to do the best that you can, but if you try to get it to be perfect, we'll, you'll be sitting on this webinar next year with no registry started. So, Next. Thank you so much, um, and please, when you know you get bogged down with the IRB and with the consents and everything else, please remember who you're doing this for. This is ultimately for the patients. And those are all of ours, or many of them. Thanks so much for your time and attention. Megan, thank you so much for uh, really a, an absolutely excellent presentation for your valuable insights and advice. Um, now, unfortunately, we've gone over time, so um, we will not have time today to address the questions that you've posed, but we are going to save them and we'll be addressing them one of two ways. One is that I will sort of triage them to the participants, uh, to the uh, presenters today, um, and, or, and or we will be addressing them in greater detail during the uh, webinar, which we will be holding on October 23rd uh, as a continuation of this webinar where we'll be uh, exploring some of these questions and issues in greater uh, detail. So uh, ver thank you every everyone today for uh, participating. Um, if you'd like to request a copy of the slides from today's presentation, please email Stephanie at the email address listed uh, on the, uh, on the uh, WebEx site. And again, thank you to our speakers for sharing your advice and insights and to our audience for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.